item is a uh, status report on the draft remedial action plan that has been submitted uh, for uh, compliance with the tasks and the site cleanup orders for the prosperity cleaner site in Marin County. And so there has been significant public interest in this. We have provided uh, public an opportunity to comment on the draft remedial action plan and we wanted to and both the, the plan, our uh, proposed response to the plan, and the uh, public comment today. This is not uh, an action item. The board has already taken action to adopt the site cleanup requirements, which include the task for submittal of a remedial action plan acceptable to the executive officer. And so essentially, we're asking for uh, input from the board uh, as I move forward to uh, complete a response to the uh, remedial action. So with that, I'd like uh, Ralph Lambert to make the presentation. Ah, and I am a note we do have a supplement. Yeah, we prepared a supplemental um, that was distributed early in the day. You should have that in speed. The draft letter with some revisions that we made to that, that letter as an outgrowth of a stakeholder meeting that we had here in the office on Friday last week. And conversations that we've had with the stakeholders. In addition, as an as an of that meeting and kind of thinking through things from a regulatory perspective, um, I also signed a notice of violation, which I included in that package as well, um, last night before putting the supplemental together that addresses the groundwater um, delineation um, aspect of things, which is a slightly different subject than the one at hand today, but I wanted to share that with you. So with that, I think we can turn it over to Ralph and have an answer. Any questions about that later on? Okay, good afternoon. Uh, Chair Young, board members. I'm Ralph Lambert, a professional geologist. Can I, I just want to interrupt for just a minute. This supplemental is available on the outside table. Yes, sir. So if anyone in the audience hasn't gotten it, please uh, help yourself. Okay. So I'm a professional geologist and certified hydrogeologist toxics cleanup division. And this afternoon I'm presenting staff's proposal to partially approve and partially reject the remedial action plan for prosperity cleaner site located in Marino Plaza. The remedial action plan will be referred to as a wrap for the rest of this presentation. The site had a series of dry cleaners 
and based on results of the investigation, the case was opened in 2008. We issued a site cleanup order in 2014 and also an amended order then. Since that time, there's been several interim remedial actions that included successfully treating one of two areas where contamin contamination was spilled on the ground. Uh, vapor mitigation inside the liquor store that's located adjacent to the former dry cleaner. And then installing a wellhead treatment system on a private well at the Severa Ranch. Interim remedial measures are cleanup or mitigation actions that can be taken quickly to address a health threat or minimize continuing release. They are not meant to be the final remedy by themselves and typically bypass public participation. A draft draft was submitted in 2015, and we are here to discuss this draft and path forward. As part of the investigation, extensive soil, groundwater, and soil vapor sampling has been conducted, as noted on this slide. In addition, samples have also been collected from Miller Creek, and indoor air samples have been collected at the shopping center. Major findings of these investigations uh, found low to moderate levels of tetrachloroethylene, or PCE, in some of its breakdown products in soil, groundwater, and soil vapor. For simplicity, I'll just refer to PCE. No PCE was found in soil vapors in the residential neighborhood adjacent to homes, and the groundwater contamination does not extend upgrading to the residential neighborhood. PC vapors and indoor air at the adjacent liquor store have been mitigated to acceptable levels. Although groundwater is impacted, no one is using groundwater containing PCE above the drinking water standard, and no PCE is detected in well water after wellhead treatment. No PCE has been detected in water from the creek. Uh, two areas have been identified for releases occurred to soil and have acted as a continuing source of PCE to the groundwater and soil vapor. One of these has been cleaned up, and the other is under the, the dry cleaning building. However, additional investigation and remediation is required. To summarize the wrap, uh, to remediate soil, the draft wrap proposes to demolish the building and excavate, excavate the key source area located under the former dry cleaner building later this year. For soil vapor, they plan to trench across utility lines and backfill the trenches with clay to minimize preferential travel along the utility trenches, followed by monitoring. The trenching is expected to happen in the next month after wrap approval. Vapor barriers are also proposed to be placed under the footprint of future buildings if sampling indicates it's needed at the time of construction. For groundwater, RAP proposes monitored natural attenuation, or MMA, for source removal, or after source removal. MMA uses natural processes to lower contaminant concentrations, such as volatilization, dilution, and natural degradation. But to be effective, there must be source removal first, and that's what the soil excavation will accomplish. New soil vapor probes and monitoring wells are proposed to verify the effectiveness of the planned treatment. Uh, for public participation over just the last half year, we have held two public meetings, one dealing specifically with the draft draft. We have met with the county supervisor and his staff. Um, they're here today. Uh, we've issued three fact sheets had a public comment period on the ramp and met with uh, selected interest parties on several occasions. So written comments on the map, uh, on the ramp, were submitted by 33 individuals, including representatives from Silvera Ranch, County Supervisor Damon Conley, and a petition signed by over 170 residents to reject the ramp. Now we're going to cover a few of the key comments. All the comments and responses are in your package. The major comment is that the RAP did not consider any active cleanup methods for groundwater and did not sufficiently demonstrate that the MNA will work. We agree. Our draft response letter requires the evaluation of a range of cleanup options for groundwater and evaluation of the feasibility of implementing 
substantial cleanup options. Another comment is that PCE in groundwater is not fully defined as a drinking water standard. We agree. But we do know enough to begin cleaning up the soil and soil vapor now. Thrax says that they will finish defining the groundwater plume off site. To date, there's been approximately 130 groundwater samples collected off site. The dashed yellow line in this slide represents the approximate area of PCE contamination above the drinking water standard of 5 micrograms per liter. Uh, based on the current information. For comparison with the drinking water standard of 5, the maximum concentration of PCE found in groundwater recently on or off site is 39 micrograms per liter. As you can see on this slide, the plume has traveled eastward underneath the freeway and underneath the ranch for a total distance so far of about 1,900 feet. The question marks indicate areas where the maximum extent of the plume has yet to be fully defined to the north and the east. The plume is well delineated vertically to the west and to the south. Further delineation of groundwater offsite will not affect any proposed remediation of soil or soil vapor on site. The nearest private well is identified on, on this slide is south of Miller Creek. And, ha and has had occasional detections of PCE at less than one microgram per liter, well below the drinking water standard. But to be safe, a wellhead treatment system was installed in this well. Water in the creek has been sampled several times, and no PCE has been detected in the creek. A major comment on soil vapor is that samples were not collected in appropriate locations in the Casa Marin neighborhood. We disagree, and I'll explain in the next slide. This slide shows a portion of the residential area of Casa Marinwood on the left and in the middle. Uh, the former dry cleaner is in the upper right hand corner. Some of the approximately 70 soil vapor sample locations are shown on the slide. Based on all the soil vapor sampling to date, the pale green shading indicates areas where PCE and soil vapor exceeded the residential environmental screening standard. Added to the slide now are location of underground utilities. The uh, natural gas line is illustrated in orange, blue, the two blue lines are uh, water and sewer, and storm drain showing green. It appears that the uh, utility trenches act as preferential pathways for the transport of PCE and soil vapor. Of concern is the location shown with the red triangle in the middle. It was located near a natural gas line and had a concentration of 2300 micrograms per cubic meter of PCE, or about 11 times the residential screening level. It was located under a sidewalk and about 40 feet from the nearest residence. Based on that, in December they went and sampled or collected samples in uh, 21 locations in the residential neighborhood. You can see the uh, red triangle here. And the 21 locations shown in blue. These samples include three locations between the red triangle and the nearest housing units, and two where the gas laterals enter the closest residences. Other locations are within a few feet of the water, sewer, and storm water utility lines. And as close to the housing as landscaping and access permitted. None of these 21 soil vapor locations in the neighborhood detected any PCE. We conclude there is no vapor intrusion to the residential units. Some have commented that proposed soil excavation is not large enough. Well, the RAC proposes excavating the soil from under the former dry cleaner where soil samples exceed the cleanup goals. The RAC proposes collecting confirmation samples from all sides and from the base of the excavation and enlarging the excavation if needed. PCE above cleanup goals was found to a maximum depth of 15 and a half feet in this area. However, significant groundwater coming into the excavation will limit the maximum depth of the excavation. 
given a successful treatment of PCE elsewhere on the site by injecting oxidizers and amendments to help biodegradation. The draft response letter recommends adding similar amendments to the base of the excavation if groundwater is encountered to help treat any remaining contamination in this area. Some people are concerned that they may be at risk of exposure. But based on the lack of any detectable PCE and soil vapor, uh, the creek or adjacent to uh, PCE and soil vapor in the neighborhood adjacent to residences, or anyone using groundwater or PCE, we conclude there's no exposure to residences at Casim Ringwood or people or the animals at the ranch. As presented at the community meeting, Dr. Linville, a toxicologist with the State Office of Environmental Health Hazard Assessment, independently reviewed the data and concluded that there is no unacceptable exposure to current on-site workers in the shopping center. She also concluded that cleanup levels proposed in the draft draft are appropriate. Some commenters in the petition say to reject the RAP because it's incomplete. We agree the groundwater evaluation is incomplete, but we know enough to begin to clean up the soil and soil vapor now, and at the same time, we'll require more evaluation for groundwater remediation. There are some comments to reject the RAP and require interim remediation. However, Task 4A of the order says we can require an interim remediation work plan if there is a potential threat to human health. But as already stated, we conclude that the existing interim measures in place, the site contamination does not pose a potential threat to human health. Interim measures are specific actions intended to more quickly address a human health issue than final remedial measures. Moving the liquor store owners out, destroying the building, and doing a large excavation under the building is not considered a quick action and it is proposed as a final cleanup action for soil. And in turn, measures would bypass the RAP public participation process. So there are only three options we have for this draft RAP. <clears throat> we can approve the entire RAP with its deficiencies, which we don't think is the appropriate thing to do. We can reject it which will cause significant delays of over a half year to do additional groundwater investigation, prepare a revised draft, and go through the public participation process again. The petition to reject the RAP did not acknowledge that rejecting the RAP would cause substantial delays. In fact, multiple commenters stated that they want the cleanup to begin now. Or we can do what we propose, and that is to approve the acceptable parts of the draft RAP so that cleanup can start immediately and require an amend amendment dealing with deficient portions. In summary, the site does not present current health risk. And most people seem to agree that soil source removal is needed and that cutting off the transport of soil vapor is a good idea. The only way to get treatment started now is to approve these portions of the RAP. In the meantime, we can require better evaluation for the groundwater options. This concludes our presentation. I'll be pleased to answer questions and welcome your feedback. Good. Um, do we have any idea what the groundwater depth is on the uh, property and nearby properties? Um, on the site last month, it was about nine feet. At the ranch, do you remember? Um, about. In the winter, during a rainstorm, it's like three feet. Uh, last uh, readings in October 2015, it was more than eight feet. Yeah, if, if I'm not mistaken, then also uh, there is a close proximity to the bay in the wetland area coming in. Could have uh, filtration into that area with uh, salt water, also possible, correct? Um, or the from, from the end of the from from the last sample to the east right now, it'd be about another mile under more pasture land, uh, 
and then it encounters the uh, or to these, then you run into the sewage treatment ponds for the uh, for sewage treatment, and and then it's on the other side of that you run into wetlands. So it's a, that's so fine. Thank you. Um, Ralph, this, this is helpful, and I'm, I'm a little confused, and I, and I want to be explicit about what has been termed as the eastern hot spot. Um, the, the, the letter, the draft letter, which we're looking at, says very clearly all 40 confirmation samples from the eastern hot spot were below cleanup standards specified in the interactive treatment. Soil and vapor remains have decreased, but they're still above. So the soil and water. So could you point out exactly where that location of the eastern <coughs> hot spot is? Okay, so um, here's the former dry cleaner and the eastern hot spot is out the back door, right, at the edge of the pavement. Uh, the highest concentrations were found in the eastern hot spot. And so it's been treated. Um, it's been treated with with uh, oxidizers and various amendments, injections. And that's reduced the groundwater or the, the, the soil levels to below the remediation levels? Yes, it's reduced the soil levels about 99%. And for water, here's the closest well to the eastern hotspot. This is total VOC, so it's uh, PC and the breakdown products. And the red line at the bottom is where the treatments, injections were taking place. And See the uh, decrease. It's still above drinking water standard. And, uh, I think it's you know, plus or minus 30 micrograms per liter, but uh, that's about a 95% reduction so far. That, that's perfect. I always read a letter from a county supervisor and want to make sure that I understand the facts, and, and this is quite helpful. So it, it's it, 40 different samples in that area have been taken. It's been remediated. We know that oxidizers work if, if there's enough food for it. Yeah. Okay, that's all. Thank you. And, and where's, so, where's the excavation that actually takes place? Under, under the dry pit? <coughs> yes. Not about all places? Yes, they have to actually move out the, the occupied liquor store so they can tear down the building and excavate underneath the building. So, now this is not something that's taken care of by the oxidizer. Right. I think I mean, they're like 40 feet apart or something. Yeah, and uh, in terms of uh, timing, um, the notion is as soon as the raft is approved, as soon as the excavation can begin, um, and I think it's somewhere like a matter of weeks, months? Or um, across the trenching, across the utilities, they, that can be done real quick. It'll take some time to move the liquor store owners out to get the permits for the building construction. But that's anticipated to happen this year. I believe we say six within six months. This is Stephen Hill with the staff. The, the schedule in the wrap says nine months, start to finish, to go through the permitting process, demo the building, complete the excavation, and submit an completion report. So that's what's being proposed in the wrap, and that's what's in our um, draft written that response letter. And what's the volume of material that I understand any data that's been anticipated? Um, the size of it is currently expected to be about 35 feet by 25 feet in size and 15 feet deep. Uh, but they'll take, like I mentioned, confirmation samples on, on every side, the specified distance, and, and see if, if they got it. Right. And, and, that will, and, and that will move all of those that are on the property or just where the drive in and liquor store are? Or? That will remove um, the, the known area that, where soil is above the cleanup level. Which is just where the dry cleaner was and where the liquor store is. Yep, yes. Stephen Hill, one more time. There are actually two buildings on the side that are, that are snug up against one another. So the southern building would get taken down, the northern building, which is occupied by an ongoing market would stay up and that nothing would happen there until the site gets redeveloped. Okay. And then at the site of the excavation, would this be paved over? Would it be a like cap on it? What would happen to I know this is something for the development. Um, I don't remember. <laughs> they, they, they would be backfilling it until development. I, I don't remember the details on paving and stuff. But uh, you're hoping to do some development. So 
that they talk about the backfill. Stephen, in the more time, you may want to address that question to the, uh, the RP as a representative here today. Great. Great. Thanks. Also note that we are recommending the addition of um, evaluate the, the additional amendments be placed into the backfill, into the pit after excavation to enhance some additional breakdown of any residual products at that point. So, I'm going to ask a question about the soil sample that you took close to the residential area with the... The soil gas. Yes. yes. With the 2300, or is it 2300. 2300, yes. So, is there, so I, I realize you said there was a gas line. I remember we did talk about this last time that maybe the utility lines are sort of creating a vector to move. Um, yes, a uh, preferential path. Right. Um, but do we, do we think that's what's going on there, or yeah. something needs to happen there? I'm just not 100% sure. Yeah, it looks like several utility lines create some preferential pathways. Okay. Um, there's, for, for the transport, mm -hmm. we anticipate once you take out the source, that is the soil, the, and, and they're cutting off the transport by uh, putting clay in the transfers that what's left will disappear pretty quickly. Okay, so we'll, we'll hope to see a drop in that number. Yes, and they, they propose, they propose as, as well as groundwater wells, uh, new ones, to verify that. So the monitor how. Of the property, 
and for Silvera Ranch to the east, where groundwater contamination remains undefined. We are still wondering today what the effects may be, but I am glad that we are finally in an opportunity to start moving ahead with meaningful progress towards cleanup. Another point that I think we can all agree on is that when we talk about meaningful progress towards cleanup and final resolution in this case, it's absolutely contingent on cleaning up the source of the contamination. The proposed partial approval calls for the demolition of the building and excavation of contaminated soil to begin within six months of approval. This is the most important outcome possible. And I'm satisfied that the scope and depth of this excavation will be informed by confirmation sampling to ensure a complete cleanup, including, and I think this was noted by Ralph, any necessary expansion of the scope of the excavation as a result of that uh, ongoing testing. The proposed partial approval allows for this critical process to begin while the other elements of the raft are refined to ensure that they meet the standards of the Water Board's cleanup order. And we agree with both community members and Water Board staff that many elements of the plan need to better address the cleanup order. I'll go through some of those now. First, MNA, or the passive approach of monitoring groundwater on the Silvera Ranch for improvement, is unacceptable. We need to explore means to bring groundwater to reliably safe levels with urgency. Other amendments to the RAP called for by staff's partial approval document focus on ensuring the effectiveness of soil vapor treatment measures by requiring additional soil vapor monitoring towards Casa Marinwa and calling for date certain milestones throughout the cleanup process. This speaks to my main concerns for the RAP and its conditional approval. It is essential that we hold the responsible party accountable to a clear and well-defined cleanup timeline with serious enforcement action to ensure compliance. Asking the affected community to rely on the benefit of doubt or good faith of the responsible party is unacceptable. A timeline for action and explicit enforcement uh, are essential. What's more, we want to be sure that conditional or partial approval does not give precedence to the RAP as proposed in regards to elements that aren't specifically addressed in the call for amendments in the staff's partial approval document. Thus, my questions and comments in regard to the partial approval of the RAP former Rindu Plaza are as follows. And these were also submitted in writing on uh, Monday, uh, April 11th, by email to staff. Number one, we are concerned that language and elements of the RAP that are insufficient and problematic, as recognized by the RWB staff, could nevertheless be pursued by the responsible party if they are not explicitly addressed in the staff's response. We request that the board clarify that the board staff's official response takes precedent over the RAP itself, should the RAP be conditionally approved. If an element of the RAP is not addressed in the partial approval document, we believe this should not mean that it is therefore tacitly approved. Number two, the response should make it explicit that no critical tasks are tied to redevelopment, and that all key actions set forth by the partial approval document adhere to an independent timeline. A clear timeline with calendar dates instead of numerical months would be a great uh, resource for the community and great assurance. And finally, number three, we encourage the RWB to include public comment during its review of future proposed amendments to the RAP so that both the general community and the Silvera family have the opportunity to review proposals. So with those concepts in mind, let me turn to the uh, supplemental packet. And I'll 
I'll start with the uh, newly revised proposed partial approval letter uh, by your staff, which I think uh, does go a long way as it stands in addressing many of the issues I just raised. But let me point out a couple things. Uh, first on page four, uh, we particularly appreciate the graph at the top, which does actually set out calendar dates for compliance. Uh, so thank you. Uh, question, though, is if the dates slip, uh, what does enforcement look like? And specifically, I bring that up because if you look at the, the second document in the supplemental, which is the notice of violation that Diane referenced earlier, it notes that there has been a uh, 40, 486 day delay already in submission of the required report uh, regarding delineation of offsite contamination. So that's a concern. If you look at page five of six, um, just a, a small technical correction, the sentence, uh, added sentence, regional water board staff will circulate the RAP addendum pertaining to items one through five. We believe that should be addenda. I mean, it's anticipated. I think in this case, there'll be more than one follow-up addenda over time. So all addenda uh, really should be subject to public comment going forward prior to your approval. In connection with this letter, I'm, I'm wondering if we, and this might be an issue for legal counsel more uh, that goes to the broader concern, if we could potentially add language to the effect of something like this. To the extent any provisions of the RAP are inconsistent with this partial approval, the terms and intent of this partial approval shall control. And again, if, if uh, that can be added, that I think would provide additional Assurance. So turning uh, to the uh, April 12, 2016 notice of violation, uh, needless to say, we endorse the need for a, a full delineation of uh, the offsite groundwater plume. So uh, apply this action. Uh, again, this, this letter notes that uh, we already stand at the 486 day delay in lateness uh, of the uh, required report. Uh, there is a sentence that says, um, by staff, we will refer this matter to the Water Board's Enforcement Unit by October 12, 2016. That seems like a lengthy amount of time, so I would seek clarification as to what that day is based on. And finally, you will be hearing uh, from uh, counsel for the uh, Silveras de Trotter. Um, he will be providing more specific comments on the state of the investigation of front groundwater contamination on the Silvera Ranch. I'll just note that uh, we've discussed those comments with Mr. Trotter, and I agree with them. Uh, most notably, the need to uh, achieve greater understanding of the pathways and geology and biology of contamination at the ranch. So let me just uh, conclude by saying we will continue to advocate for community interest in tracking this process as it proceeds. And again, thank you very much uh, for your attention to this matter. Yes, questions. Questions. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. I appreciate it. Um, I presume the county will be a responsible party for the permitting of demolition and excavating. Is that correct? That's correct. This is unincorporated uh, land. There might need to be, I think, the city's reference at some point. It should be the county. Right. Along that line, normally, do the permitting agencies are able to accelerate the permitting process? I know I'm involved in permitting, and normally it takes a long time. So when we're talking timelines, I think that's a very critical part of our clean air, potential cleaning effort. Absolutely agree, and I think everyone recognizes the urgency. Thank you. Are you uh, able to speak?
stay till the end of this uh, discussion, or? Yes. Um, otherwise, I was going to offer for the staff to respond to some of your comments now, but I think it would be nicer if we could do it at the end. Much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we could have uh, Bill McNicholas, and I understand that there are three of you who have more or less coordinated your comments, so if you all wanted to be prepared, be on deck, uh, that's uh, Mr. Day and Mr. Nestel as well. Thank you. Segments of the timeline. Today, <clears throat> unfortunately, I got my notes and I just got me all confused. What's that? Okay. All right. Apologies. Unfortunately, the, uh, the board of management has for failed to enforce these conditional approvals and have instead relied on the failed practice of voluntary compliance. Today, we'll be recommending, which they've already done, that you again warn the discharger for violating the terms of the order and further delay cleanup of the site by conditionally approving this fatally fault uh, 
flawed rationale. We have repeatedly requested the regional board management require interim remedial actions. This goes back to early mid last year, which we've been in almost every meeting. We began cleaning up contamination on site and off site as provided in task 4A and 4B of the amended order. To date, only the IRA that they've required has been with the wellhead treatment on the ranch. So, this is the time. Okay. All right. Yeah, okay. Uh, Ralph had already talked a little bit on the timeline. The right cleaning operation started in 1965, ended in 2005. The uh, water board opened the case in 2008. Uh, chemical injections were started by the discharger in uh, 2008, ended in, I think it was 2008 or 2009, ended in August of 2011. Water board order was adopted in February of 14. The amended order was adopted in August of 14. Silvera Ranch groundwater remedial investigation started on December 2014 and continued to July 2015 where it stopped. Soil vapor investigation west of the site, November 2015, and residential soil vapor investigation on December 2015. This figure shows, you the light problem here, I gotta read. Shows that as of nine months ago, the groundwater contaminant plume had migrated more than a half mile from the two sites. Nice. Deeper out. I'll just show up up there or not. Yeah. There it is. From here and the uh, east hot spot, right over here under the yellow corner. It goes out approximately a half mile currently. And uh, no one knows for sure how it goes because they never finished testing to define the plume for the width, length, and depth. Notice that the question mark at the eastern end of the groundwater plume. This is the discharger suddenly telling the regional board that they have violated the terms of the order by failing to delineate the lateral and vertical extent of groundwater contamination as required by task three of the order. Notice how after flowing more than a half mile from the sources of contamination at the site, the contaminant plume conveniently ends just past the last sampling point. This is intellectually dishonest because the PCE concentration at that location at the eastern most sampling point for C29, which we'll show you on another version, is 35 uh, micrograms per liter. This is essentially the same PE, PCE concentrator reported in sampling locations in the eastern margin of Highway 101, more than a half mile of gradient. These data show that the discharger has no idea how far the groundwater contaminant plume has gone or where it is going, and neither does the regional board management. But they always seem to be willing to overlook the serious discrepancies and recommend to conditionally approve the RAF, which is based on these incomplete and misleading data. Since we don't know the extent of the contaminant plume or how far it's moving, we do know the PCE concentrations remain, remain high through its length. Yet the only remedial action approach included in the RAP requires a starting point that the plume must be stable or retreating, that is MNA, and that the contaminants are degrading naturally. The discharger has included in the RAP that these conditions have been met and proposes to leave the contamination in place. Really? many generations. This is an off-site sampling location to give you an idea of what's happened. Let's see if I can get up here for laser. Here's the uh, cleaners over here. And this is the first row, which is done, I believe, in October of 13, was sampling where project manager at that time pushed to get them to sample under the highway on the other side. The spacing over on this side was like 50 feet apart. You jump over and finally in December of 14, we got to start to do testing here. And as you notice, the sampling goes further and further apart, up to 200 feet, which you don't know what's going on in the medium where that groundwater is flowing and taking the plumes. Be 
because it's based on alluvial soil, you don't know. Also of critical importance is note that this charger has not installed not even one monitoring well off-site out on the range. Consequently, there has been no groundwater monitoring and there is no way to determine the groundwater gradient, groundwater flow velocity, or how the contaminated plume is moving. Uh, board management may not understand this very serious efficiency, but even the discharger concluded in page 21 of the rec, it is difficult for valuable possible changes in VOC concentrations in off-site groundwater because the off-site groundwater sampling events have been conducted at different locations and at different times as knowledge of the groundwater VOC plume has evolved. Okay. Last slide for IPI. This charge includes in 2007 to go back through GeoTracker that surveyed monitoring wells are necessary for accurate remedial investigation. Our question is why? In our experience, actual con concentrations of PCE and PCE in site groundwater may vary from grab samplings. Also, grab groundwater samplings does not allow determination of the groundwater flow direction at the site. This is best determined using monitored and surveyed wells. Last comment as I wrap up. Partial approval with the amendment. It just goes to the opportunities of not competing because there's gaps or potential gaps in it which can develop into litigation somewhere down the line. And by permitting this with the timetable they're looking at, we could be redo the wrap resubmit it within approximately the same time table. I know in every proposal they're talking a minimum six months, but they can put a date on it for the financial fine that made up to start the actions because the earliest they're going to be able to do their uh, remake and get it started is going to be somewhere around middle to end of August. I'm going to turn this over to Ray to get this time. shows you where we've seen before where the uh, 2300 is and you can pick up where does it go from there there's no indication I've asked that question ever since it came up in uh, October's meeting last year and nobody knows there's nothing in the plans to determine how did it get there where is it going Just, uh, uh, I'm Ray Day, Greenwood also. Uh, I just wanted to clarify one point that uh, Bill mentioned. We're talking about the off-site wells. There's on-site wells, but there are no off-site wells. And the ones proposed are way at the end of the plume. So there's nothing in between identifying what's happening with the groundwater flow, where the streams are located, that, go over to Miller Creek and that, that uh, contain uh, the uh, contaminants. So I just want to clarify that, that for you. Okay, the wrap contains 20 references uh, of actions to be taken upon uh, redevelopment. If the remedial action plan is accepted, this then leaves uh, the situation very uh, vague in terms of dates for compliance because of the idea that here we are and potentially depending on redevelopment or development, depending on what uh, appears in the original draft or draft draft, whatever you want to call it. The site was discovered in 2007 and the, the cleanup so far has been delayed for eight years. So, you know, I don't know how long we have to wait, if we have to wait 20 or 50 years or something to get this thing fixed up, but this is just ridiculous. Uh, will a conditional acceptance of the WRAP allow the discharger to assert legal rights to vague definitions and problems not explicitly addressed? That's one of our major concerns there. The WRAP is internally inconsistent and fatally flawed. 
The rat must be rejected is our position. Remedial action plan deficiency. The order required remedial investigation. If they were supposed to delineate the extent of contamination in the groundwater and soil vapor plume, that, that uh, 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 guidance was also given back in 2008 to delineate the extent of contamination in soil, groundwater, and soil vapor. And here we are today still talking about delineation of the contamination. This is just amazing to me. Rat deficiency, groundwater contaminant, extent unknown. Soil vapor extent unknown. Okay, compliance with EPA circular guidance. That was one of the items that was contained in the order that it complied with CERCLA. It was also found in a directive memo from uh, management staff to the, uh, to the discharger that they were to be complying with CERCLA. And to date, we still don't see that. Remedial investigation is incomplete. A feasibility study does not consider applicable remedial technologies. And by that, we mean there's remedial technologies that were used in Silicon Valley on similar uh, toxins, contaminants, and those were not even considered as far as a uh, technology to go ahead and remediate the site. The order requirement appropriate, uh, appropriate proposals for cleanup of contamination. Rat deficiency, groundwater remedial technology proposed not applicable to the site. No soil vapor remediation is proposed. No remediation for deeper soil proposed. Okay, and the proposed, some of the proposed remediation uh, specified is MNA. Well, MNA is being used both for groundwater and for soil vapors. And that is not a solution. It's been proven that MNA is not working. If, if you recall from previous um, presentations that we've had, the groundwater remediation uh, by MNA was supposed to take place uh, within a very short period of time. It's been 10 years since there's been a cleaner there, an active cleaner. So 10 years, we still haven't had results. We have soil vapors, and we still have not had any results. So this is really a problem. And we don't see that m &A is going to be the solution. What we know, domestic water supplies for Silvera Ranch are, have been impacted. Groundwater plume extends over a half mile. Over 50 million gallons of drinking water have been impacted. We don't know the width or the length of the plume. PCE concentrations are at least seven times MCLs at a half mile from the source. We don't know where the groundwater meets the water cleanup standards. The uh, eastern hotspot is located next to the property line fence. And this is, this is in the rear of the dry cleaners. Okay, no investigation was conducted on the eastern side of the fence. The wrap does not treat Caltrans property, and that there's a, has been a um, grab sample that was done over there that exceeded all of the ESLs, so there's, but there's no plan to go ahead and treat anything there, which could supply additional contaminants over towards Silvera.
And just to give you an idea, we wanted to take some pictures as far as where the contamination is. On your left-hand corner, upper left-hand corner, that is the rear of the, uh, where the cleaners was. The hot spot is there where the arrow is located. We have the fence, which is behind the cleaners, which is over here. And the, there's no plan to go ahead and propose to clean this up. And this is another area where there's a, another hot spot out here on the ramp. So these are some of our concerns as far as they are not mentioned at all as far as in the cleanup process. No off-site monitoring wells have been installed. Groundwater, we don't know the groundwater gradient or flow velocity. We don't understand how the contamination is moving. That's why we need more monitoring wells and a network of those monitoring wells. We know the Silvera Ranch has been impacted. We don't know if contamination will increase. We know the toxic vapors are 11 times ESLs, and that's adjacent to the homes that cost them ring with. We don't know if the residents have been exposed to toxin, except for those monitoring or those grab samples that were taken, which were located on gas lines and where the contaminant flows are, the high uh, counts of the contaminant flows were, were, were located along the storm drains and sewer lines. So that's another concern. Now I'd like to turn it over to Stephen Nessel to complete the slide presentations. Thank you. So hopefully a few doubts are entering the mind. Right now. Uh, the I'm sorry, we need you to introduce yourself. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. My name is Stephen Nessel. I took the oath. I'll try not to talk too close to my understand I have a loud voice. Um, so, uh, basically, to summarize this, uh, there's been a history of non compliance and lax enforcement. Uh, it's routine. Uh, pattern uh, that uh, uh, the order is not the orders have not been followed by, and the directives by uh, the water board. It's a repeated pattern of delays um, and it's taken incomplete years. They've had seven years to address this concern. It seems to be a routine pattern practice of uh, the water board management to uh, have conditional acceptance of incomplete, non-compliant, and unacceptable work. Um, the routine practice, there's also routine practice, apparently, of uh, reminders, uh, but no actual enforcement orders or conditions of acceptance. And so uh, this documents a clear pattern in practice of non-compliance. Voluntary compliance with the order has failed, and it's unacceptable, and that's why we're here today. And we're not filling time to anybody. We're taking time away from our lives. Um, the reason is to mention. What's that? I said, speaking of time, well, we were uh, we agreed to give you folks some some extra time to do the group presentation. That if you could speed it up a little bit, we're we're. Uh, well past what we had wanted, so. Okay. Um, the reason to re reject the it doesn't comply with your order. The su it's a superficial remediation approach. Uh, the discharger uh, said, I, I don't know where we're getting 15 feet, there was soil contamination down at 35 feet. So we want to know what's happening between 15 feet and 35 feet. There's no um, proposal to clean that soil up. Um, and we learned that previous conditional approvals equal non-compliance. Order amendments do provide for IRAs for remediation. Let's use them. Uh, a conditional approval simply rewards the discharger for failing uh, to follow the order. 
cleanup will, will delay the, the cleanup. Uh, cleanup can be implemented right now using IRAs. You have that power. The RAP proposal is so weak, it's fatally flawed. The rational, conditional uh, approval of the RAP will require complete completion of the uh, remedial investigation, completion of soil vapor remediation, and installation of a uh, groundwater uh, monitoring well uh, network and routine ground well monitoring. None of this was done. Conditional approvals had not been enforced, and that's how we got here now. The RAP is so deficient and fatally flawed, we need to start over again. Now, if you're building a house, you want a strong, good, strong foundation. In science, you need a good, strong foundation of knowledge. We don't have that now, and when um, Ralph uh, mentions that the health impacts, uh, we can't find reasons for health impacts, well, that would be based on um, solid data. We don't have that. So if we don't have solid data to begin with, how can we say there's no danger? We don't know. This is what we'd like you to do. Reject a remedial action plan. Require re interim remedial action. Uh, require compliance with the order, your order. Assess penalties for non-compliance. All this non-compliance, such as uh, not putting in a, a groundwater monitoring network, has saved the discharger an estimated six figures. Direct uh, the management to enforce the order and follow up uh, review by board members, and I guess it's commonly done actually not by this board, but the LA board. We had a recent crisis, well, we still have a crisis in Flint, Michigan, and the reason for that uh, crisis, uh, generally agreed to, but uh, professor at Stanford University uh, says it was due to a failure of government responsibility. Guys, that's you. The public is relying on you. And what we heard earlier today, unfortunately, it sounds like the discharger is very well being taken care of, but it's the people, the people of my community, the, your neighbors, the receptors that are going to have to deal with this. And this is why 236 people signed the petition to urge you to reject the remedial action plan today and build a strong foundation. We're counting on you to protect our community. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Um, I do have a card from um, Mr. Wilmer. And the card says, available for questions, but yeah, that's, that's I, me. I'm just going to be like, yeah. If you want to make a comment. I'm a lawyer for, if you have questions for me, I'm happy to answer. Okay, but you do not want to make a statement this time. Oh, thank you. 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 Thank I guess it's David Trotter first, because you don't look like your name. That's right, uh, Madam Chairman, thank you. Uh, my name is David Trotter, and yes, I did take the oath. Uh, my client, Renee Silvera, is here. She was not here to be sworn in, but I'm assuming you can take care of that when she comes up to speak. We can do that. And um, uh, let me just say that I, I will be uh, considerably briefer than the presentation from here, but um, basically, heard a lot about the fact that, that the groundwater on the Silvera Ranch has been contaminated and they use it as a drinking water supply. So this is a high priority for the water board and therefore there needs to be a high priority given to the development of, of active remediation. Uh, the staff has told you that they don't think that monitored natural attenuation is sufficient to agree with that. We think more needs to be done. That's all I'm going to say about that for the time being. 
Um, however, um, the draft response letter that you've been uh, given, that includes the modified version that you got this uh, earlier today, uh, isn't sufficient. Um, the real problem here is this, and it goes to the foundational aspects of this. Um, there's no reference in that response letter um, to the need for including direction uh, to the responsible party to conduct and complete a thorough and sufficient off-site remedial investigation for groundwater. The RI is the first and most critical step in getting to an effective wrap that meets the cleanup goals, and right now, there's no reference to the remedial investigation phase uh, and the fact that the current draft wrap completely fails the test in terms of providing an adequate remedial investigation. Now, we propose some specific language uh, to the draft response letter at the request of staff. We recall that uh, Diane White referred to there being a stakeholders meeting last Friday. I, in fact, emailed something over uh, yesterday uh, uh, with a few targeted sentences. Uh, I would like to share some of this language with you in writing. And, yeah, I know the chair has the discretion to allow me to do that. Yes, we do. Staff 
has not provided, at least in intent, the information that you've asked for in, in the letter from Diane White. Let me read the specific sentences that I think do this. It says, Are you referring to the revised version? Of the no, it's the notice of violation. It says, Marinwood Plaza has failed to complete the chlorinated and volatile organic compounds offsite delineation and is therefore in violation. So it finds that they failed to do, as, as I think you said, the, the delineation of the plume. And, and then it, it, it is a little more specific. It, on the second page, it says, to date, the northern and eastern extent of the CDOC groundwater plume is not delineated and make those risks. Can I, can I respond to that? Yeah, I, I, I see something more specific here. That was a question. But, okay. but I, other than. Can I just also say something about timing just to eliminate this a little bit more? Um, I was working on this till pretty much like I left last night about 6.30. And we had essentially wrapped this up. Mr. Trotter and the others had not seen the NOB or our supplemental. And while I was hitting the final PDF, made it into a PDF button, he received his email. So there has, there, we, we crossed paths there in that, in that regard. Um, right. I'm clearly So I'm just making sure you understand that there wasn't actually a discussion about this in regard to that. Language can all, yes. always be improved. Yes. Uh, you know, I, my work needs editing as well as everybody else's. But, but in terms of intent, I see very clearly, not merely a, your study isn't good enough, but you're in violation because your study isn't good enough and it's specific to the eastern and down gradient you know, to, to, the, to the northern and eastern extent. And I remember seeing the numbers, so I kind of remember all of that. Um, so other than the specifics, is there a significant difference? There is, and let me explain why. Okay. Um, it is correct that Diane, that, that she did not receive my email uh, until late in the day yesterday. In fact, I, I pushed the send button at noon, and it got, it got messed up in your email system here for some reason because I got a bounce back message four hours later and then ultimately she got um, So I don't know what happened. I'm not a technical guy. Um, but if I, I wish that that hadn't happened because then Diane and Ralph would have had it at noon yesterday as opposed to getting it sometime around five or six. Uh, be that as it may. Um, the, the point that you raised, sir, though, is you, you, you referenced this sentence on page two of the notice of violation, and I actually had you anticipated where I was going brilliantly. Thank you, um, because the sentence you you, you uh, referred to is quote to date the northern and eastern extent of the CBOC groundwater plume is not delineated and may pose risks to down gradient receptors. And the problem with that is that the problem isn't from the Silvera's perspective that they haven't delineated the full northerly and easterly extent of the plume, because by the time you get there, you're going off their property. The problem is that they haven't adequately delineated the, the nature of the plume, the subsurface ge geology, hydrology, where the preferential pathways are on the Silvera Ranch further to the west. And that's the problem with this NOV. Although I don't have any problem with it being sent, it, this NOV doesn't actually address the flaws in the analysis occurring further to the west on the Silvera property. That's why we have a problem with that. Now, that's why I also think that perhaps for purposes of setting out an NOV, they had to seize upon the language that was in the original cleanup order to send this NOV. I but for purposes completely. of the RAP, there's more that needs to be done. Okay, okay. thank you. Um, so, because you, <laughs> I think because you, you anticipated my question, we got to a circle that I was otherwise going to, and I think you get the central point that I'm trying to raise here. Um, I want to make one other point, and that is that any public, there's been talk about opening up the public comment, comment period for any future agenda to the RAP, and, and my addition to that, which is reflected again in the inserts to that letter, it's the last insert, it's 4B, is that in addition to having a, at least a 30-day comment period for the public, is that this should come back to the board so you can give further direction, because obviously this is a contested matter, and we want to make sure that we're doing the right thing that the board is giving essential and important direction on future remediation activities and options and things that need to happen so that you, in fact, do protect important, 
groundwater and drinking water supplies in Marin Wood and on the Silvera Ranch in Marin County. I'll be happy to answer any questions if you have. I have one question for Mr. Clark. Um, I may be misremembering, but about two years ago, I think we first came at least in my awareness on the board. And there was a question about access to the Silvera Ranch for monitoring. Is that a past issue? There's no problem getting monitoring wells? The, the, the issue wasn't access for monitoring wells. The issue was access to take initially craft samples um, because we didn't know what was there. We didn't know whether we needed to go to the necessary step of actually putting monitoring wells down. So there was a negotiation and ultimately an agreement reached that they could come on and take craft samples because to delineate, to start the delineation process. As you know, that process started happening uh, in the latter part of 2014, we're now April of 2016. And we knew fairly quickly after they started taking samples that they were getting hits from those graph samples that indicated that there were exceedances on the Silvera property. My understanding is that the water board staff early on after that approached the responsible party and the consultant to suggest to them that they be talking about installing groundwater monitoring wells. Uh, we didn't know about that request. I think that if we had been approached with regarding that, we would look upon it with favor because you need those for an RI. But that, my understanding is that the, the RP responsible party did not want to incur that expense, and we never heard about it. I think now it's very clear that expense needs to be incurred, and the Silvera family will cooperate and would like to have input through their own technical consultants into where exactly those groundwater monitoring wells are going to be placed so that perhaps we can achieve the kind of cleanup that needs to occur. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you. Ms. Silvera, we'll do this quickly. What happens is I, I read a lot of stuff that talks about procedural things and the hearings, and then at the very end, and there's a question about whether or not you intend to tell the truth and you can say yes or no. <laughs> All relevant evidence that any person desires to be considered by this board must be introduced at this hearing, first by the board staff, second by the discharger, third by public agencies, and fourth by any other interested persons. The board and board council may ask questions to clarify the testimony of a witness at any time. Cross-examination of any witness by others will be allowed following completion of direct testimony by all persons. Each person testifying will commence by stating his or her name, whom he or she represents, and whether he or she took the oath to tell the truth. The hearings will not be conducted according to technical rules of evidence. The board will accept any evidence or testimony that is reasonably relevant to the issues. All board files, exhibits, and agenda materials pertaining to this matter will be made part of the record of this proceeding. Additional written material will be made part of the record at the discretion of the board. Those wishing to testify in the hearing will now rise or raise their hand. Do you promise to tell the truth? Yes, I do. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Renee Silvera, um, and representing Silvera Ranch, my mom. Lorraine Silvera is the owner, and I'm not going to be redundant. I appreciate all the time you've given to this today and in the past. I'm just here to really underscore that we're really kind of, my mom and I are very astounded by the um, ongoing insufficiency of um, the Plaza owner's investigation. Um, the way we look at it, um, the action has been just, you know, to see, you know, how, not how much, because they haven't really um, quantified that as they should, but to get kind of a sense of what they're damaging. But as far as corrective action, um, it's just not happening. There's a protective measure in terms of the, the wellhead treatment, but it's not getting to <laughs> the contamination that we have on our property. And it's really, really alarming when we look at those maps and we see that big, you know, swath of land that is impacted by this situation. It's really, really um, very, very alarming for us. And um, I can understand um, the neighborhood's reticence about the um, RAP being adopted as is. Um, I too am a bit not real trusting of what's going on 
with um, the recommendations um, from the Geologica. The plaza owner wanted to wrap it up December 14 after some groundwork sampling. It was because of our attorney and the board that they had to do further testing, which of course led to the fact that we now know that our well water is being impacted. So, um, and then now with this recommendation of the monitored natural attenuation, I mean, that is totally a bogus recommendation for our property. So I think the credibility uh, of the property owner is really, for me, in question. And, uh, and for my mother as well. And so, you know, we totally understand that reticence. So we are going, you know, with our attorney's recommendation to conditionally, to go for a conditional approval of this wrap. But it's with the understanding that there will be no loopholes that will allow, you know, further action. It's really action, you know. And, and I realize that there's going to have, there will be more studies needed to really understand the traits of the groundwater and all, how it's moving and how these contaminants are, are, are moving through our property. But we really, we, we really want corrective action. We've just waited so long, and this is just really, really so disconcerting to us. So we thank you very much for your assistance um, in, in helping us get this resolved. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. I think we have a couple of questions for you. Oh, so there's. Yeah, may I ask you quickly? Um, do you now or in the future have any possible access to municipal water on your property? We do, but it's not at all affordable for us to use it for our dairy. I understand. So you do have municipal water on the property? Yes. Okay, thank you. And, uh, and the second question, do you have any idea what the estimated gallons per minute, per minute is out of your uh, groundwater well? Um, let's see, David, do yeah, sure. Uh, there are two grand, there are two groundwater wells. Mm -hmm. um, the, the well and I live on wells, so excuse me. I, I, I feel your pain. But <laughs> I I just would like to know what type because there was an estimated 50 million gallons stated. Yeah, that's I heard that estimate. Uh, I don't know that you need. I to wish we had a 50 million gallon uh, water supply. You know, <laughs> if, if your question is to that, I think the answer, the proper answer is whether it's 50 a 50 million dollar underground water supply or it's a one million gallon under water water supply, which is called a million gallons. I, I, think what I, was, to be I think what I was looking for, if you're producing 30 gallons per minute out of the well or 50 gallons per minute out of the well, as I understand in this uh, uh, permit here, or this application, they're treating one of the well heads at the present time. Is that correct? And it's capable of producing about 20 gallons a minute. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Appreciate that. Thank you. We have one more card um, from Mr. Aubrey from Geologica. Hi, I'm Brian Aubrey. I'm with Geologica, or the consultant for the owner. I have taken the oath. Um, Let's make a few remarks, and uh, we're here if there are uh, continue the discussion and questions. Um, but let me first say that uh, Tom Fitzsimmons, uh, the owner's rep, uh, regrets that he couldn't be here today. He's actually on vacation for spring break. He would have been here, so, but we're definitely uh, here. Um, uh, secondly, the, uh, you know, it, it has been and it will always be the intent of the of the ownership to be responsive to the requirements of the board and to proceed uh, as expeditiously as possible with the investigation and the cleanup. Uh, the uh, uh, the groundwater characterization off site I think has taken longer than anybody expected uh, when we first started to see evidence of contamination off site. We expect it to step briefly off, and then it's become you know, fairly complicated characterization. I think, as Ralph mentioned, there's been 130 groundwater samples collected off site, so it's been a much larger effort than has been anticipated. Um, having said that, in response to Mr. Trotter, 
I think the uh, subsurface characterization has actually been quite detailed. The, uh, we've been investigating and sampling separate sand layers all the way down, and uh, you know we've made substantial progress, but we've recognized all along, even with this in the middle of the raft, that there is going to be additional characterization necessary. Uh, we were trying to get the process moving. Um, and we also recognize that uh, groundwater monitoring models are, are going to be required. In response to the uh, to the RAP, uh, the RAP comments from the board, uh, you know we are prepared to uh, proceed with the uh, 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 the excavation on site uh, as soon as we get approval of the RAP. Uh, I think at some point in the process there was an intent to tie the cleanup to site redevelopment. I mean I guess I like to say emphatically that that is no longer the plan. The none of the work going forward is tied to redevelopment. So, so that so this presentation we saw there being 20 references uh, in the wrap being contingent on redevelopment being accurate. That is yeah, I think that is a bit of a mistake. But the, the work the schedule is now uh, going to proceed with the approval of the, or the conditional approval of the wrap to uh, instigating the slow vapor controls in the trenches and do, uh, beginning with the, the building demo and the excavation. So the, the process is prepared to, uh, to start itself uh, with that approval. Okay, can I take you back for a second to the groundwater investigation? Sure. When do you expect the remedial investigation to be concluded? When do you believe that the efforts that you're putting in will ultimately get to a point where you'll be able to identify a lot of level and vertically extend the groundwater contamination. So, so we are in receipt of the NOV letter, which I uh, got this morning. And uh, the, uh, we were planning to put together a plan pretty much right now to route for doing additional work off-site. Uh, we were hoping to complete that work in the summer, uh, sometime uh, September-ish. But again, I've said that before. So it, it's sort of contingent on our ability to step out and get to the end of the flume. I mean, somebody commented on the fact that these steps have increased, and that's true. Uh, we've been following sand layers down gradient, but we've increased the interval between the uh, between the investigation points because we're trying to, to get to the end. What, why has it taken so long? Uh, it's just a, an involved process. Uh, there's uh, every time you go through a series of investigations, you, you get the data back. I mean, every one of these, every one of those sampling points requires multiple borings. We have to do a CPT hole, and then we identify all the sand layers. Then we come back and do multiple borings for each layer. So each location is associated with five or six four, uh, additional borings. So it's an involved process. And it's been going on sort of on a continuous basis every week, every month, perhaps? Well, no, I, I, I think somebody said it's every few months. I mean, we've built, we'll be out there every three or four or six months. Mm -hmm. It just takes time to work through the data. Mm -hmm. and, and we've been focused on other things, like the uh, the uh, soil vapor investigation. And what about the, the question that's been raised about the ability to pick a remedy before the remedial investigation is even completed? What, what, do, you, what do you say to that? How do you, how do you have a wrap? How do you have a remedial action plan which comes on the heels of a feasibility study, which in theory comes on the heels of an RI? How, how do you do that if you don't have the RI done? And you, you can see if it's not done, you're still working on it. Right. I think the hope was to, uh, that if we got the remedy in place on site, if we removed the source, that we would start to see reductions off site. Um, as somebody said, the, you know, the maximum concentrations offsite are 39 micrograms per liter, which is relatively low. I mean, it's five or six times the MCL, but in the world of PCE plumes, it's actually relatively low. And so I think the hope was that we would uh, remove the source and then we would install the monitoring well network offsite, concurrent with completing the delineation of the plume, and we would see reductions. Um, having said that, we're, you know, we've received the comments on the RAP to do the feasibility study, and we're pre prepared to proceed with that. I guess I come back to my earlier question. What, what's your best guess about when you think you want to be able to identify this 
go past and look for some. And with, with regard to the middle of the of the RAP addendum uh, for the feasibility analysis in particular, we're going to ask for a few more months to complete that because we'd like to complete the delineation uh, concurrently as we uh, complete the RAP addendum. So I think the the document calls for completing the RAP addendum in, uh, on July 1st uh, and feasibility analysis, and we're going to ask to extend that date to September 15th so that we can spend the summer completing the delineation. And, and we also need to start putting in the monitoring models. Some of the data we need to do the feasibility analysis, we need to put in the monitoring models to do. Uh, we need to measure hydraulic conductivities and uh, collect some of the data that might inform the MNA. Uh, did you have additional portions of a statement? I couldn't tell whether you were quite done. Uh, yeah, I was pretty close to that. That was. That's good news. That's good news. <laughs> <laughs> Approving 
approving certain things and then everything else is unapproved or that is, is the other way around? That is correct. And so the way this works is that the order, the original order that this board approved had a very broad brush requirement and the task was go and develop a work plan. And so the work plan has many different elements in it. And so the letter that you have that staff is proposing to send to the discharger will approve certain of those elements, but it says that certain of the elements do not meet the requirement of the order. And so to that extent, the discharger is in violation and there's a discussion about potential future enforcement at the end of the letter. Okay, so there's nothing that falls between the practices. It isn't either explicitly approved or explicitly not approved. I mean, that's the concern. Not that we're aware of. And we've made every attempt to identify where those areas would be. Um, can we add some language that says, if we missed something, don't consider it approved? Supervisor Connelly did propose mm -hmm. um, some language that was a little bit broader than our mm -hmm. initial focus that had been raised to us, which was whether there was a discrepancy about this time of development. We're happy to take a look at that again in conjunction with the right to see um, if that helps at all or clarifies at all. We've attempted to clarify the main issue that we knew that there was discrepancy about for clarity. Um, we've also gone through all of the stuff in detail and I specifically um, looked at it from my eyes of the prosecutor who ends up with these cases and the end of the day, we worked with Tamron to make sure that if we weren't giving away our enforcement authority on any aspects of this, and that still would be clearly maintaining that, and that's really where we are with the, the language that is at the end of this letter. So um, I think, yes, there are still, as you were, people are still uncomfortable about the steps moving forward, but really, how we go about taking enforcement is, is evaluated at the time in which we really need to look at the violations at hand and go through an elaborate process as dictated by the enforcement policy. So we can't really, all we, you know, we can cover our bases here, but we can't really speculate into the future about how we would go about that process. We have our order in place and we try to be clear that there were inconsistencies in the deadlines in which the enforcement go back to the original deadlines that were in the site we have requirements, so we're not even extending that at this point. So that is our best attempt to cover our bases from a regulatory pers perspective such that we can see action take place on the ground as soon as possible. And when we were out in the meetings with stakeholders, we really wanted to make sure, is there any objection to that piece of it. And I think we've heard no objections to the excavation. We have, we've heard concerns about how the excavation may take place and where it's going to take place and how big it's going to be. And we've attempted to address that by being clear about our expectation of confirmation samples, about the possibility of amendments. And of course, we always have to recognize set safety concerns. But um, we, at the staff level and legal, can't figure out another way to move forward as quickly as possible to address that source area besides what you see in front of you with this um, proposal. So I'm just going to emphasize that again, is that pulling things back and saying no and having another draft submitted and having public comment on that draft when we've got something in front of us that we believe will make the biggest difference that can be made at that site within what we feel is a very aggressive time frame. I mean, six months to start excavation, nine months to complete it. That's what we're pushing for here. I, I, I do think that there are opportunities down the road as we get more data to continue to talk about the other lingering component of this, which is the material that's already being released. But I think the emphasis from staff's perspective is to put forward something as tight as possible to move forward with that action and maintain enforceability. And so um, we welcome your input on that if there's another way to go about doing that. But I think um, we could not Sure. Uh, let's see. Uh, Supervisor Conley uh, also asked, um, we talked about uh, making clear that the uh, no critical tasks are tied to redevelopment. Uh, we talked about that. We don't think they are. Uh, Supervisor Conley also asked uh, the board to include public comments during this review. 
for that for that in future plans. If you add that, that's going to be solved by material that you have. Uh, Stephen, maybe I can add to that though. There was a comment related to that about why we were not asking for public input per se on all the tasks related to the addendum. And we tried to focus on the tasks that, the, that we felt the public really needed to be in, involved with per se, because in general we're trying not to slow down the process. So there were other parts of that addendum that we feel like we could move forward with rather quickly if we're comfortable from a technical perspective, which is why we only highlighted um, the public process being for items one and five on the addendum as opposed to um, the section that should be expanded to consider the addition of approved contaminant treatment amendments into the base of the excavation and groundwater as encountered because that's pretty straightforward from a technical perspective. So we're, we're dealing with, you know, most of the things we're talking about is something that's typically done through EO approval in-house to expedite moving forward. The public is asked for our input. We're happy to provide that, but at the same time, we don't want to really slow down the process when we think we're getting some traction moving forward. So there was a little bit of questioning about that more specifically. Um, also, because we think some portions of that agenda could be submitted sooner than later, and so we can make decisions on those sections sooner to move forward as opposed to what we recognize to be the bigger question of how the groundwater plume is going to be remediated. And certainly we're not saying that that should be subject to a public process if needed. But I'm also, my, our intention is to work closely with the discharger and the affected parties to see if we could actually reach agreement on the final remedy. And if that is indeed the case, then we don't feel like we actually need to come back before the board if there's not you know, the public's desire to do that. But certainly, if that is the case, we're, we're certainly not opposed to that just by way of the language of the end, so. Okay. Um, let me touch on uh, a couple of points that were made by other speakers. Uh, Mr. Aubrey said that they would like uh, additional time to prepared the other uh, the draft addendum so they could get out and do some field work. It's good to see you can just speak a little louder. All right, is that better? Yeah. Okay. Uh, Mr. Aubrey, on behalf of the, the, the RP, asked for a bit more time to prepare the draft addendum. I think we, we can take that into consideration. Um, we, we, it would be nice to have a bit more field work that would go into it. Uh, at the same time, we're, the drive is in the fact that time is passing. So uh, we're open to that. But if you have thoughts about that, we'd appreciate it. Um, and I guess the other concern we have there is that a lot of this stuff tends to happen later on. In other words, you, you get enough data to pick a remedy, and then you get more data to actually implement it. And we don't want to bog down what I would call redesign activities and, and delay the
favorably inclined to the line of his wife's comments to take the cab and work as it may be to get the, the subsurface ground uh, soil remediation done. And I think that makes good sense. I think that the community's concerns about whether or not the full extent is captured by what's planned to be excavated will be captured by the plans here. Um, I, for one, would urge that we hold the responsible party to the shortest of time on this possible at this point. I think that uh, I don't want to find uh, them their motives or their intentions here, but, but it's time to get this done. And uh, I think if there's a choice to be made here, uh, it should be made on the side of really getting this done. So, um, that, that would be how I would respond to something that you put before us in the session. I don't, I don't really have any other comments other than to um, echo what Bill has said about essentially it does seem like a lot of work is not going to do it, and we haven't, it really is going to move to the next uh, stage. And I substance of this matter, but about the process. All of us hope that when you get the right people together and, and you work on communication, uh, things will, will gradually work out. And I, and I appreciate in particular his efforts to bring the county health staff to help with the trust issues, because I think that was very important to have some independence here. Um, and I also got to tell you that I've never seen quite as sophisticated a testimony from, a, from an elected official coming into reacting on the fly to a supplemental, uh, I was impressed, you know, even as nerdy as I am. Um, <laughs> I, I, I also appreciate the activists. Uh, they've not merely kept the heat on, but they've added substantial information. Um, I, I want to be perhaps a little more forgiving to the dischargers than some, having done some of this work and having chased unknown things in heterogeneous soils. Uh, it is not unreasonable if a, if a plume is confined to only want to excavate once and, and save costs. And uh, I've never seen a plume which has moved as fast as this one. And, and uh, Now, I will give the activists credit for pushing and holding everyone's feet to the fire. I, mean, I remember when I first saw, I don't remember if it was C29 or 32 or 37, but all of a sudden there were much higher levels than anyone would have expected. And, and, and I will give you full credit for that. Um, doesn't mean I'm going to do exactly what you, or we should do exactly what you, but, but government works best when it has citizens involved in, in pushing in, and I do appreciate that. Um, I think it's really simple. Um, I'm going to steal a line. I don't know who the originator of it, but I heard it from Dr. Davis at the Estuary Institute. When the kitchen flooded, First, to turn off the taps, then you mop. And, and I think that's what we need to do here, and that's what's before us. Um, we need to excavate the area. Uh, I know enough about sidewall excavation and confirmatory <laughs> samples in groundwater, that that's kind of a messy process, and you won't be allowed to, step, to stop until it's so muddy that you're better off amending the soil or you really chase down the extent of it. And that's what's before us. That's really all that's approved. Um, you know, MNA is not approved. There may be such things as pump and treat or amendments or things. You know, I, just philosophically, I'm always a little unwilling to throw away groundwater with something like pump and treat if you could do something better. So while it's not being approved, it's also not being ruled out for all times. It really depends on finishing the characterization, and also beginning to understand if, if we shut off the taps, 
how, how much it's going to improve things. So um, I, I really appreciate everybody's efforts. Uh, we have a really good geologist working on this. He, he understands really complicated issues. I guess to, to Mr. Trotter's point, which is a good one, you're right, we don't completely understand the pathways, but again, I don't think we necessarily have to. At some point in investigations, you're chasing finer and finer information, and you know enough to make responsible decisions and move forward. We don't on the groundwater yet. And, and I think we have staff that are going to require that investigation to continue until we know that. But I think we do on the excavation. And, uh, you know, I did chase down the question, which I picked up from Supervisor Connolly's and, and also from the other testimony, whether or not we needed to do any work on the Eastern Hotspot. And we don't, and it's also promising that we know that in some circumstances, we can amend the soil and get some bang for the buck. So um, we're not done, but, but I think we're, you, you know, the staff's proposal here is a really solid one. <coughs> Um, I'm really impressed by the level of involvement of so many interested people to come to uh, the right decision, and I'm really, really impressed by the Mobile Citizens Group uh, organization and the investigation and their leadership on this issue and raising and sustaining it as a, a, being a, a resource to the community. And, uh, I'm really thankful to Supervisor Conley for his leadership on this. And leadership and to help restore some trust in the process. So we appreciate that. And, uh, you know, I think like everyone else, I, I really feel strongly like movement forward is essential at this point, and uh, we have plenty of opportunities for finer gradations of good. But for me, the, you know, the frustrating thing coming out of this board in December 2014 is to show up and see, well, this is a six-year-old issue that point and uh, the source is still there. So I'm, I'm just glad to have an opportunity to at least get at the source while we continue and to investigate and refine our investigation and our actions going forward. Thank you. Uh, I want to get clear. Uh, I, I don't think any of our staff or any of us have been on the uh, side of the discharger. Please, uh, with all respect to those comments there, I, I understand your nine wrapped efficiencies, but I, I have strong confidence in our staff, and I'm sure the vice chair of uh, supervisors up there has strong faith in their staff too. So I, I always defend our staff. You can criticize me, but don't criticize my, my staff. That's the way I look at it. But I think uh, without a doubt, I look closely at this uh, recent comments here regarding uh, toxicology reports of off-site residents. I mean, our main purpose in any elected or appointed position is the health and safety of the public. And that's my opinion and always has been. And I think we are trying to provide the best health and safety to the public in that. Even though it did take uh, the community to step up and maybe hit us a little harder with uh, the uh, two by four instead of the olive branch, but at least we understand where you're coming from and we want to ensure that we move forward with the professionalism and the legalities of how do we get this thing brought to closure because we cannot, I cannot stand another hearing and I want to take care of our, our property owner, I want to take care of our cows and I, I please this is, uh, we, we did not, uh, this last slide here about Flint, Michigan, it hurts me as much as anybody to uh, think we would not take responsibility for this, but trust me, we are. And we didn't do this as a cost-saving effort either for anybody involved, but we want to ensure we protect the environment and protect the health and human uh, life of all of our neighbors there. And for full disclosure, as we went through all day, I drove by it the other day, okay? <laughs> so I know where you are, and I know where you are. All right. Um, I, I have a, a couple of, a few points that I would like to reiterate, and just so everyone knows what we're doing procedurally. This was an informational hearing, and what we are, uh, what the board is doing now is giving its direction to the staff for next steps. Um, 
we don't do that as a, a unanimous body because we haven't had time to sit down and write it, so we're doing it one at a time. So, and uh, that's my turn. And just to be clear, sir, this is not an action, and it's not an adjudicatory item. This is an information and stats report, and this is feedback from the board. What she said. <laughs> no motion. No motion. This is just feedback in, in a future direction. Um, all right, I'm, I'm sympathetic to the point that was made about the fact that it needs to be really clear what's proved and what's not. Um, so as you go back and, and look at the language in the letter, uh, I'm quite sure that you'll be able to make sure that that is, that we really accomplish that. Um, it also is, really important uh, to me, and, and I think John was just saying this uh, as well, that we make sure to take care of the ranch landowners. They happen to be in store to somebody, and uh, yet they find their grandmother to be, um, to be contaminated um, at this point. So we need to, we need to make that right. Um, to the extent that it takes um, an off-site investigation, um, on the staff to make sure that they consider what an appropriate off-site investigation is, what appropriate measures will be. Um, just uh, that, because that's an important part of this process. Generally, what I heard from, I think almost everybody, is that it's really important for us to have a clear timeline. I think the staff is, is trying to do that. But support that wholeheartedly. We need to make sure that the decisions that we're making about um, cleanup, that we think the cleanup is going to be adequate, that's the standard we always live by. So I'm, I'm assuming that that, you know, I don't even need to make an assumption. That's what we always do, but I wanted to let you folks all know that that is what we will do. This cleanup will be to um, appropriate standards, and we won't stop until we get there. Um, I'm a little chagrined to have the issue of, of uh, enforcement actions brought up as if we hadn't responded appropriately so far in terms of taking enforcement actions. So again, I want to direct staff to, to internalize that comment even more than maybe you would have otherwise and make sure we're pretty clear that if people don't do what they're tasked to do, we take whatever enforcement action is appropriate. That was my short list. And unless there are additions from other members of the board um, or questions or responses from the staff, I think we can. We, we might have used a, a little bit smaller than a two by four, but <laughs> maybe a one by. I made a, made a point earlier about, about the discharger asking for more time to submit the wrap addendum. Um, we'll think about that, but if you have any thoughts about that, uh, I guess I heard one, uh, one more comment about do it as quickly as you can. Uh, but if there's anything more than that, uh, we'd appreciate it. From my perspective, it's do it as quickly as you can, but if, as long as there's no compromise, no compromising of the quality of, of quality of the uh, ultimate cleanup. Okay, thank you. So, since ultimately it be my signature on the letter, uh, I appreciate all the input, not only from uh, the board, but definitely from the community and all the stakeholders. And I think we've, we've heard a couple of messages, including looking at some of the uh, language uh, further. I, I feel we, we've made, continue to make a number of changes as Jim notes sometimes you can always make changes to a letter but my goal is to uh, do any further tweaks to our draft letter and finalize it and get it out by the end of the week and get this going and I think everybody recognizes that no matter what the uh, uh, what you call it we need to take action and get action going now and no time on the present so uh, that's our next step uh, we have included language in here that uh, we will uh, circulate uh, some of the uh, wrap the tenda for public comment and we'll keep you posted 
focused on that, the timing of that, and how that works moving forward. So uh, we're clearly not done yet, but I think we've got next steps, uh, and it's always, as the, the board chair says, you know, clarity is, is appropriate to move on. Make sure it's clear to everybody where we're going and uh, the fact that what we're doing is enforceable and, and what our expectations are for moving forward. All right, thank you. That concludes the board meeting for today. Appreciate you all coming.